Well, just to give you a little bit of background um, about uh, the City of Waterloo and their engagement with neighbourhoods. Um, historically, the City has always uh, strongly supported neighbourhood associations through a couple of different channels. So we have a lot of neighbourhoods that have formal associations that do lots of great things in their neighbourhoods um, and we do our best to support those. Uh, we also have uh, different grants and things uh, where we try to support um, that resident engagement at the neighborhood level. Um, but our neighborhood strategy came about um, thinking about, you know, we support these groups, but what are other things that we can do? There's still so many people um, within our city that we want to support to be neighborly and have community connections. Um, so that was sort of how our neighborhood strategy started. Um, it, it was a way to get strategic direction um, to build on some of those resources um, and sort of build those things we offer to residents. Um, and also just, you know, the, the things that we're all looking at um, as far as neighborhood development, you know, decreasing um, connections within neighbors, loneliness is increasing, um, and especially in Waterloo, uh, we have a really growing and changing community. So all of those factors kind of accumulated to us looking to start a strategy and you know it was, it's a way to help us allocate specific funds get support from council um, you know have specific business plan goals and things like that so that's kind of how we ended up um, starting a, a strategy um, so who informed our strategy was sort of on a simple level broken down into three uh, different groups um, so we had a staff Team. So that was from various departments, so um, policy, cultural, um, and communications as examples, um, helping to inform some of the work that we're doing. We also had a steering group, um, so that involves staff, as well as a lot of strong community leaders. So we had some re representatives from neighborhood associations, um, organizations such as the Waterloo Public Library, our local volunteer action center, um, school board representatives, so people that are key in the community to help um, with some of this neighborhood work, all contributing to the strategy and its development. And the last one um, was a resident panel, um, which turned into panels. So um, what we basically did was a call out within the community um, to see residents that wanted to be involved in creating the strategy and really being involved from the beginning um, to develop it. We actually had so many people apply um, to be on the resident panel that we ended up having two, which is a fantastic start um, to the neighborhood strategy um, and having residents involved. So those are kind of the three different pillars um, informing its development. Um, all contributed throughout all stages and feedback um, on specific topics or to specific points um, within the strategy. Uh, so the strategy itself and its actual development um, took about 19 months. Um, so that seems like a long time uh, for that amount of commitment, but it really was important to get everything um, as connected to residents as we could. Um, and so that involved a lot of community consultation and involvement. Um, so to start off, we had uh, a number of individuals provide input on scope. Um, and at the conference I mentioned, this is a really important lesson, um, I would say, for everyone doing a strategy. Uh, we did do this from the start, but we did see in conversations um, that scope was something that came up um, and that, you know, the built environment, for example, is really important to neighbors and how they interact with each other. But that was outside of the scope of our neighbor's strategy. Um, so we used it as a way to, you know, refocus and say these things are really important. Uh, to neighborhoods and how they develop, and uh, we will see some of them influencing neighborhoods, but for the purposes of the neighborhood strategy, we're focusing on what can we do as, you know, residents, staff, um, different organizations to bring neighbors together. Um, we also looked at all of our strategic plans across the city, so um, an older adult strategy, uh, a cultural strategy, those types of things will also influence some of the neighborhood work that we were doing. Um, best practice research, of course, um, so surrounding cities, um, obviously, you know, Kitchener is an next door neighbor, um, cities like London, Hamilton, other areas that had strategies or even um, particular tactics and things that they were doing with neighborhoods um, that we 
wanted to consider in our project. And then as far as community engagement, we really uh, tried to involve neighbors in whatever way they wanted to be involved. Uh, so a couple examples of things that we did for community engagement uh, were street teams. So we had some summer staff and volunteers that went out to various events and activities in the community. So for example, um, our St. Patrick's Day event in our public square, uh, they went out and just chatted with people to say, you know, what would you like to see in your neighborhood? What are things that you'd like to better engage in? Um, you know, different neighborhood association events, uh, lots of things across the city. Another outlet was kitchen table talks. Um, so these are essentially focus groups, but uh, they were resident led ones where they would invite people over to say, for example, their kitchen table um, with some food and snacks um, that would be funded and we just chatted with neighbors about, again, sort of what do you see in your community? What would you like to see? What are things that um, would help you be more involved? I uh, also did some things like contests, uh, story sharing, traditional formats like an open house and online surveys as well. So after all that, uh, we ended up uh, with a vision and some guiding principles um, to sort of start off the process. Um, so you can see here on the screen, uh, the vision was that Waterloo is a city of caring, vibrant, engaged neighborhoods where everyone belongs. So this is kind of uh, the vision that we used to formulate other pieces. Um, so there's some guiding principles. I won't go over all of them in detail, um, but there's six of them, um, and they speak to how we framed our final recommendations, which will be coming up next. Um, but they're things like uh, neighborhood community building should be resident led. So that's traditionally uh, what the city of Waterloo has always supported. And we wanted to just look for ways to better support residents uh, to do these types of projects. Um, so that's a key pillar um, and principle. And then, you know, other things such as city departments working together to help residents. Um, collaborating with other partners um, and residents themselves are really at the root of what makes neighborhoods great. So our final recommendations, um, there were 18, which is a lot. Oops. So I crammed them all into this little screen, which I wouldn't normally do, um, but you can access them on our website as well. Um, and some more detail of the action items underneath them, but I wanted to give you a good picture of, of what those actually look like um, and what are the things that we're going to be moving forward, implementing, and what that looks like. So we're going to get a whole team here and try to summarize them a little bit um, to keep them up there on the screen. Um, but under each of these final recommendations, we essentially have a number of actions um, and then in the document, we identify what the city will do. So for example, um, final recommendation number three, um, we say we're going to nurture place-based neighborhood pride, belonging, identity, and placemaking. So some actions that the city committed to under that final recommendation are share ID, ideas and how-to guides to build neighborhood identity. Um, so, for example, the one that I mentioned at the beginning of the call, um, uh, helping residents do street or sidewalk painting um, as a way for them to better connect um, within their neighborhood. Um, another um, action item under that was that neighborhoods um, will work with neighborhoods to identify a neighborhood name. Uh, so, in the city of Waterloo, uh, the areas that have tend to have neighborhood associations or more informally refer to them as neighborhood groups have names. So for example, we have Uptown West, uh, Laurelwood, a number of different names and uh, residents know that's where they live. You know, I live in Laurelwood, where do you live? And about half of the city doesn't have an assigned uh, neighborhood name. Uh, so part of that um, is that we would work with residents to discuss, you know, is this something that would help you better connect and feel a sense of place in your neighborhood? Um, so along with that, another action item that we identified uh, was supporting the use of these neighborhood names um, through various outlets, so signage perhaps in neighborhoods, supporting that. Or uh, we have a city map where we identify all the neighborhoods. Eventually, we'd love to see that um, with names for each neighborhood and how residents can connect. 
uh, other examples of action items under that just that one final recommendation are uh, funding for new community gardens, outdoor rinks, and similar projects in city parks. Um, so those are ways that neighbors can really build that identity in their park. Um, obviously, lots of other projects come up through neighbors as well, but those are specific programs where we have um, resources and staff time allocated, and we want to see more of those, and we want to uh, support those uh, through our programming. And the last one, which will be exciting when it gets here as well, is establish a neighborhood-led community art program. Uh, so our arts and culture staff have been really great working with neighbors that want to do unique projects. So for example, we have one group that wants to paint uh, a storage box in their uh, neighborhood park. So they're working with an artist to make that possible. So we want to specifically create a program that will help connect residents with an artist, uh, perhaps different types of funding, things like that. So that will be a vision for the future as well. But so those are all action items that fit with under that final recommendation number three. For all 18 uh, recommendations, we have different actions that the city is committed to. Um, also, community partners would be involved as well. So for example, our final recommendation number five um, speaks to cohesion with um, all residents, particularly residents um, that live in areas with post-secondary students. So really key partners in that final recommendation will be um, our two local universities and college um, being involved in how we can better connect um, students um, and non-students and all residents that sort of live in those areas surrounding those pieces. So um, that's a lot for that one. I'm not sure if anyone uh, has particular questions now if we want to wait till the end, but I know there's a lot of information there. So uh, all of our recommendations. So now, the fun part of implementation. Uh, so we are at the stage of implementation, which is exciting, and we started around September of this year. So we're fairly new into that, um, but there's lots of exciting things going on. So I'll give you examples of action items um, and their implementation a little bit later. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that um, all of our final recommendations are basically put into a timeline um, near the end of the strategy development uh, to a lot. Obviously, when staff um, will be working with community members to do some of those pieces, but also um, it was a great way for us to communicate to the community when we expect to do um, each of the different pieces and also to, to talk to council about when we need budget. So. Uh, each uh, item that involves budget is in the chart and the timeline, um, and it identifies how much budget we'll be asking for at that time. So, for example, we're kind of in the initial stages of 2019 budgets, um, and we've already asked for the funding, or 2020, uh, and we've already asked for the funding for those pieces that we anticipate will have costs um, moving forward. So, that's a really key piece of our strategy um, from a staff perspective is it, it gives us an opportunity to outline um, in advance what we see the resources are um, that the community needs and we have the strategy and all of its um, guidelines and recommendations to sort of back up where that funding request is coming from. Um, obviously, as I've talked sort of throughout this call, um, supporting resident-led actions is still the key piece of this. Um, so not everything's going to fall into its perfect timed box, um, as I'm sure we all know, uh, working with community. So the key is to still just focus on those resident-led actions. Um, staff are here to support um, and to make those things easier, um, but residents are the ones that are sort of that spark and that stir to um, that involvement. Um, and then also the implementation helps us um, engage with partners. So for example, I mentioned our post-secondary um, educational institutions or um, our local United Way is another example, our library. Um, our final recommendations give us sort of timelines and guides to engage with them and purposefully have conversations about the pieces um, where they might be involved. So you can see um, our actual implementation chart online um, from our website. So I can provide the link to that um, if people would like. Um, so it just sort of charts out some of those action items and funding 
Um, and you'll see we try to sort of balance the objectives and resources. So we didn't want to ask, you know, for all of our funding in 2020, um, for that to be sort of an unrealistic expectation at council and, you know, with residents. So we've tried to spread it out um, based on, you know, what we heard community. The community is really, really passionate about getting started. Some of those things in the beginning and some of the things that might be a little bit more complicated and take some time to develop by our, uh, near the end. So some examples of our implementation. Um, this one is near and dear to my heart. Um, <laughs> it's the most challenging for me. Um, but also the most rewarding. So I did talk about this example at the conference, but it's um, it's just so important, I think, to the work that we're doing. Um, one of our commissioners has coined the term, let's explore. Uh, so essentially what this philosophy is and speaks to one of our recommendations is uh, that staff teams will work together to try and figure out what's the best way to approach things for the community. Uh, so. Historically, we always had a, a community garden program in the city of Waterloo um, for the past number of years, um, but we didn't have a ton of projects that were coming forward, and they were a little bit complicated um, because we really wanted neighbors to do the work and use it as an opportunity to bring people together. But on the other side of the coin, um, we didn't allow power tools to be used in parks. So uh, if you see a lot of community gardens, they have raised beds, they have lots of different things that involve tools. So this was a challenge uh, that we took on um, to try and see how we could better support these groups. So eventually, um, to the residents, uh, we've made it easier for them to use tools for these garden build days to start off their community gardens on the right foot um, and bring people together to contribute to that. Um, and internally with staff, there's a lot of processes to go through with um, our legal department, uh, our parks department, different um, staff members. But eventually, uh, what the community saw was that they were able to do that. So we are exploring other things like this, so looking at um, you know what's the risk versus the reward for the community, because ultimately that's what we think is important. So the, the let's explore philosophy um, has been applied to some other things already as well, uh, hosting campfires in local parks. Um, is one thing that we've also been working on. So this is really about um, staff taking the time to think about how can we help out the community, what's the best approach to make sure everything's safe, but also that we're not uh, putting up red tape for things that we want the community to involved in. Um, another example of what we're implementing. Oh. Going one back. My slides here. Um, are the neighborhood leaders team and neighborhood summit? Uh, so one of our recommendations was to bring neighbors together. Uh, so using the example of neighborhood associations again, we have a lot of great neighborhood associations, but they operate in their neighborhoods, um, which obviously makes sense. They want uh, more opportunities to network with each other, interact, see what other people are doing, and also people that are new to you know, starting a new project or they think they have um, an idea that would be really interesting, it's great for them to be able to talk to people already doing this type of work as well. So uh, the Neighborhood Summit is an action that's come out of that. So uh, we're planning for one this fall um, to bring people together. Our uh, neighborhood leaders team is going to help inform what that looks like. Uh, could be some capacity building at that summit, could be mostly a social aspect, it could be some uh, story sharing, but I think it will look slightly different um, every year depending on, on what people are wanting to gather about. Um, the leaders team um, is really exciting for us, so uh, similar to what we did for the resident panel, we did sort of a call out uh, within the community to people that were interested in being leaders um, and took two people from each ward, uh, some maybe already involved in neighborhood work, some completely new, some maybe you know have a particular set or things that they want to bring to the table um, and they're going to actually work with us to inform implementation uh, so some of the areas where we have budget assigned uh, some of the areas where logistics are going to be something that's completely new to us that team of residents is actually going to help us decide 
where we want to go with things. So we've identified, for example, as one action that we'd like to have event equipment um, available to residents. So that can look completely different. We've had requests for, you know, giant board games, which we have um, already in our uptown square. Using those for neighbors, we've had people that you know really have requests for basic things such as tables, chairs, um, all that kind of stuff. So that neighborhood leaders team is actually going to be the ones um, helping us think about you know here's the benefits of this option, um, cost, you know logistics, and you know here's some other options and work through that as a team. Uh, so we had our first meeting um, at the end of June with that team and they're really excited to dig into some of the projects and uh, how those are gonna look for neighborhood resources. Um, another implementation piece that we have our toolkit. So I've spoken briefly of these a couple times already, I would say in the call, um, but they're basically ways to, to make it easier for residents to do things. So we've historically had a, a very strong outdoor rink program so we basically have a toolkit that says to people, you know, here are the different things you need to know about operating your outdoor rink. You can give it to new volunteers. You can use it as a reference, you know, when something maybe doesn't go as planned. Um, and then uh, also applying for a neighborhood matching fund. So that's a grant that we have, sort of walking people through those steps, starting a community vegetable garden, and then we have others in the works as well. So simple ways to connect residents. Um, to be able to do things in their community. Um, and lastly, um, another example of our implementation uh, is mini grants. So we've had the Neighborhood Matching Fund uh, for a number of years and residents can apply for up to $7,500 um, for that. But $7,500 is a lot of money for some people. Um, so that grant comes with an application and a budget form that needs to be filled out for it. Uh, the mini grants was a way for us to provide sort of seed money, if you will, um, for neighbors that are maybe first in their first exploration of a grant or they're kind of hesitant to commit to a really formal, not that it's super formal, but a formal application and budget. Um, so we're providing up to $300 for neighborhood projects. Um, so it's really simple. They contact myself or my colleague Amy. Um, to tell us about their projects. So it's kind of, you know, who is the main organizer? What are you doing? What would you like funds for? And it's as simple as that for them to get up to that $300. Um, so we've had a number of projects that have happened already, which have been exciting. Uh, we had a group that did a greeting card workshop sort of around the holidays. Um, we have a new neighborhood association that's starting to form that came to us for a mini grant for, you know, some seed money to get them started, um, do some different potlucks and things. Uh, a neighborhood that con held their first barbecue uh, for a mini grant. We've got a street party, um, residents that are interested in doing some traffic calming measures in their neighborhood. And a unique one we had just the other day was um, a group that's going to receive some funding for green practices at their events so they've often held potlucks um but they throw out you know all the utensils all the plates all that thing kind of thing at the end of each um so they're looking to have some reusable things um to share within the neighborhood for all their activities so another way to bring neighbors together um but thinking about uh, the environment at the same time for that one so an exciting implementation pieces um so Moving forward, um, what we're really trying to do with our strategy is make uh, neighborhood connections easy. Um, and different ways to support these are, are what we're trying to offer to allow that. So, you know, what works for one group might be completely opposite for another group, and we know that. Um, so with the range of resources and things that um, are being led by residents, uh, we hope to offer so many different things that people see how easy it is to get involved and be passionate um, about doing something within their community. Um, and we're also looking to engage more residents. So uh, we have historically engaged with our neighborhood associations, you know, residents that come to us with project ideas, but we really want to let people know that um, these things are available. Uh, we're here to help and, um, you know, our neighborhood strategy is a way for us 
to let people know about that and also offer a much broader range for those types of things. So I've talked for a lot, um, but I'm wondering if people have questions um, or want to have some dialogue about what I've shared. Thanks so much, Julie. I will turn it over for the questions, but I know I have lots. So if anybody has one and they want to go, I will give you a moment. Hi, Julie. It's Heather Keen here. Hi. Um, I, I, I apologize. I missed a bit of the, the beginning part, but I'm just wondering, because um, a lot of cities um, do, they already do these programs. They have a, like a grant program. They have um, a program that does street parties. And so um, in, ter in terms of the strategy, like what is the benefit of doing the strategy? If I'm already doing a grant program or I'm already doing street parties or I'm already doing um, um, park stuff, what's the benefit of a strategy for a city? Yeah, so I did touch on it a little at the beginning, but really mm -hmm. for us, um, it was a way for us to offer additional resources, um, engage more people, um, and then also to address uh, some of the things um, strategically throughout the city. So um, a neighborhood strategy was a way for us to specifically allocate resources to neighborhood work. Um, so council can see through the neighborhood strategy what the benefits are of that are um, and be involved in updates. Um, be, you know, perhaps and hopefully more likely to approve uh, the funding when it is asked for and also it's just a way for us to specifically lay out a timeline of how we're going to introduce new things and consciously you know for example engage new partners um, you know we always kind of have at least hopefully other people do this too but we kind of have a list of things that we really want to accomplish but the day-to-day -day gets in the way and the neighborhood strategy is a way for us to specifically say you know okay we're starting work on our special event uh, equipment and, you know, we need to talk to local businesses that offer special event equipment um, and that type of thing. So it's a purposeful way, I guess, to expand um, and strategically build those resources if that makes sense. And, and I know you're fairly new in implementing this. What's the benefit? In Sorry, you kind of cut off that at the end for me. Oh, what's the um, uh, benefit internally? Yeah, so, I mean, for our department, it's, it is a benefit that we're hoping we're engaging more residents um, to be more connected in their neighborhood. So um, that in turn is seeing things in their neighborhood, such as, you know, increased safety, um, decreased loneliness, those types of things. Um, internally for us, um, it allows us to advocate to other city departments um, to explain, you know, through the neighborhood strategy, this was developed for this reason. Um, and this is why, you know, we're asking our traffic department to be involved in the street and sidewalk changes, which isn't something that they would typically put um, at the forefront of their work plan, right? So it's, it's a way, again, for us to advocate um, for that work internally with other departments um, and also for the community. Great, thanks. Um, so I'm just thinking about that. How do you how do you build that case with other municipal staff? Like, if it's in the strategy, you've heard from folks. Is there? Do you do some sort of evaluation of what you're doing, or yeah, how do you do that? A good question. <laughs> um, it's it's a tough process. So we haven't specifically. Um, strategically work with all the departments yet. We're sort of looking at what that looks like as far as, um, you know, workshops and different things with them to better help them understand it. Um, so far, it's been more on a project-by-project -project basis, so that sort of let's explore philosophy or, you know, other people have framed it as yes and um, instead of, you know, an immediate no. So right now it's been focusing on the neighborhood strategy and pointing to, you know, your key goals, this is how it's helping our community. Um, and then with each staff team sort of discussing what that means for them. So moving forward, we will be looking at maybe some ways to measure um, 
those changes in in our collaboration with other staff. Um, but right now, we're still in the initial stages of 